after I've hatched all this in with a very hazy outline, I then will switch over and go to a more precise pencil. And you saw me uh, sharpen this earlier. I might take my sandpaper out and sharpen it just a little bit more because I've been working since I last spoke to you. And just get this a little bit sharper. And so that looks good to me right there. And now I'm going to start with this one basic idea that we are putting a light bulb in the upper left hand corner of this drawing right here. Now this light will illuminate every object on this paper. So that light bulb is shining its light down like that. Um, let's start with nailing in the external contour. The external contour is simply put, it is the line that separates the form that we are rendering from what is behind it. And so the external contour, uh, it can actually be said that there is no such thing as a line around anything. There's no such thing as a line around my hand. We just see my hand and we see the paper, but our minds actually place a line. We give it this abstract idea called a line. We superimpose it onto everything. So right now we're going to force our eye to reduce the complexity of a sphere to a line. And with this symbol, you already understand the volumetric form that I'm alluding to. So you don't have to spend a terrible amount of time rendering these forms, but I'd encourage you to just kind of quickly just sketch them in. And again, this is the external contour. External contour of a cube, external contour of a cylinder. Now, it was said that during the Renaissance that the art, that artists such as Raphael would practice making perfect circles freehand in his book because in his sketchbooks, um, I haven't seen those sketches, but um, the circle was deemed to be a picture of perfection. Um, there was, it was absolute perfection. And if you could, with your hands, with one motion, render that circle, um, you were getting close to perfection. There's an interesting little, uh, there's an interesting painting by Rembrandt in which there is a circle behind his head in the background, which we understand to be an allusion to this, to this Renaissance, Southern Renaissance, to Greek idea of the perfection of the circle. And that if you could perfect the circle, uh, you were a, you were a master. Um, the, the painting, um, with the circle in the background is a reference to Rembrandt's having arrived as an artist at the place of perfection. So again, that's a belief that's uh, widely held, uh, in looking at that painting. So I'm going to put right here, I'm going to put the word, um, external contour, the words external contour, and I'm going to label this one. Okay. Um, later on, I actually will go through with a, a, a numbering system. It, you know what? I'm going to backtrack on the number one. And instead of putting in the number one, I'm just going to put an external contour for the moment so that it doesn't get too cumbersome. So over here, I'm just going to put a dash, just going to put a dash. And I'm going to walk through this circle right here, turning it into a sphere. And as I walk through turning this into uh, a volumetric form, I'm then going to hop over to the other geometric forms. So the next term that we are going to work on is something called, if the light is coming from this side, it is called the shadow shape. So we're all familiar with how light hits a sphere such as with the moon, this would be like a three quarter moon right here. And that line right there 
we would call the shadow shape. The shadow shape is the boundary between light and dark. So if light is coming from here, this is a light, this is dark, we can draw a line where the shadow runs, and that's called a shadow shape. Uh, you might be able to see it on my hand a little bit right now. Um, right here, the shadow shape would run down my thumb. Right here, that would be a shadow shape. Uh, let me try to get another strong shadow shape for you right here. <clears throat> that would be the shadow shape on the cylinder of my arm. The shadow shape um, on these other objects will be placed in shortly. Next that we have, next time we have, is I'm pretending the light's a little bit in front of this uh, sphere, and so the shadow is going to go a little bit behind. And this line right here is the cast shadow. Now the cast shadow, um, we can put again a line around that cast shadow just as we put a line at the boundary of the light and dark on the form itself. We're going to return to this, um, but suffice to say, the, the cast shadow, uh, depending on the height of the light, the, um, the, well, there's a lot of qualities to light. Sometimes it's diffuse, sometimes it's pinpoint direct, but we can always close our eye and squint in order to look at the cast shadow and simplify it in the most basic of terms. Okay, so there we have it. We have light on our form, we have an external contour, we have light on the form, we have a shadow shape, we have a cast shadow. Now we can go into more subtle information. So let's start to render in by putting in lines over the form. We're not going to really necessarily keep these lines, but that's my dog sneezing in the background. Thank you, Tess. Adds to the genuine quality of this lecture. Um, so we can begin pulling lines over the form of the cube, uh, I'm sorry, of the sphere. Uh, so why don't we just fill it in like that? Well, you can, actually you can. But what I want to demonstrate is if you ever look at a globe and you see the lines of longitude, uh, latitude and longitude, they curve around the form of the sphere. And so we want to start, we really want to start exercising this whole idea of really feeling the underlying volumetric form of the of whatever it is that we're working on. So I'm just gonna hatch this in quickly. Again, this is just a little demo. If we wanted to, we could spend two hours rendering a sphere, um, but I'm not really interested in going two hours into it. Uh, but I will go like this quickly and just hatch in some lines. Just like so. Okay, so again, not going too crazy on it. And I might even, the natural arc of our hand can be exploited in a case like this. So you can shade it from above so that the arc of how your hand actually works runs with the arc of the form that you're rendering. I do this in painting all the time with a paintbrush. I turn my arm in the direction. If I weren't on a video right now, I'd turn my sheet of paper so that I'd use the arc of my hand to get the arc of the subject. But for the sake of video, I won't be flipping upside down right now. Okay, so now what we are going to move into is this whole idea of light on dark, dark on light. Uh, light on dark, dark on light is really, it's a convention. I can't find the root of it. Uh, the further back we go in history, I can see it used all the way back to Pompeii. Um, you can see how artists would put dark up against the brightest light, right here. So that is the background. And then they would put light up against the darkest area. So look at, as a comparison, look at how dark this is against how light this is. Look at how light this is against how dark this is in the shadow. So the importance of this is that oftentimes 
in nature, the, the values um, are not arranged this way. But we as artists can override nature and we can foist upon our subject things that we want to see that aren't even there. So you can go as rich as and dark as you want with this. Artists such as Caravaggio would place their darkest darks up against their brightest brights for this really rich uh, juxtaposition. And the darker this went, the lighter that went. And if you don't mind me jumping over to different uh, to different genres, different mediums uh, for a moment, uh, there's a term in literature called a foil. And authors such as William Shakespeare use this uh, to great, um, greatly in his work, uh, Charles Dickens, just to name a couple, where authors will sometimes in literature place the darkest, most twisted, depraved character, let's say an old, wicked, evil man against a young, beautiful, innocent child, dark against light, and the two play off of each other and heighten each other. But then sometimes you don't really want such a great, um, you don't want such a great vibration between two elements. So then you can kind of like, if you want this to just melt away a little bit right here, you can keep these somewhat closer. Our eye is drawn to contrast. Our mind is drawn to contrast. Uh, we, as, as we are created, for whatever reason, our eye goes right here when you look at this drawing. We don't immediately go right here. So now let's go ahead and put in that cast shadow. I'm gonna get my dull pencil out. And just mass in that cast shadow. And there we have it. You might be asking, well, can I smudge? Uh, you can smudge in an area like the cast shadow. Probably hold, hold off on smudging over here for the time being. Maybe I'll do it down the road. Um, some artists have a rule, never, ever, ever smudge. Um, my, I don't have a rule like that, but I do feel that um, you should hold off on smudging until you're sure that you really understand what you're smudging, what your hand actually is smudging. Sometimes artists just smudge uh, in an effort to soften things and it gives a different aesthetic. Uh, but for me, I prefer to understand the form and then start smudging. So I'm gonna go in and I'm actually going to get an even uh, sharper, more precise instrument. And I'm just going to really, really pop the dark on light, light on dark element. I'm going to increase that contrast right there. So dark on light, light on dark. Um, so let's move forward with the next concept. I'm going to take my dull pencil and I'm going to go in and really darken this moment right at the shadow shape boundary line. I'm not going to make it ridiculously dark, but dark enough. So now what you'll see as I'm doing this, um, the transition is a little too severe. So now I'll go in and I will sort of lighten this right here. Now, if you want to do this only with pencils and not with your fingers, um, it's a great exercise. And I will post uh, a drawing later on that shows you how you can do all this for hours to come up with the perfect sphere. Uh, whenever I'm demonstrating, I like to point out that a quick demo has different uh, purposes than a highly rendered study. You wouldn't want to see me here for two hours rendering this sphere. Uh, it just wouldn't be productive for you as the viewer. I just want to get my basic concepts across. So I'm going to blend this right here. So now I can go and I can strengthen this somewhat. Trying to pull the line, again, those latitudes and those longitudes, trying to pull those over the form just like so. Okay, now we softened the shadow shape and that's feeling quite a bit better. And we can identify two things taking place right here. We now have the highlight, 
But in addition to that highlight, we have something that I've done over here. This is called reflected light. So I'm just going to put a line here and call this the highlight. And this, the, let me go further down here, reflected light. So now think for a moment of light not as being um, an immaterial, you know, there's debate whether light is actually particles uh, or is it, it travels in waves, but it's not a particle. So there's a lot of debate back and forth amongst um, physicists. My thought with light is that light has matter. Light, light is matter, it has substance. I'm talking about in, in an artistic sense because it travels in waves. So I'm gonna think of it almost as being water. Now, if I took a, f a fire hose of water and sprayed it right here at this sphere, some, uh, most of the force of that flow of water would hit here, but it would hit less right here because it's coming not at such an oblique angle, right? A direct angle. And the further along you go, the less the water is going to reach there. This is going to stay somewhat dry in comparison to the impact of the water. But some of that water is going to hit and bounce back. And that's, that bouncing spray backwards that hits and bounces back all through here, we can call that the reflected light. So again, if you're having a hard time thinking of reflected light, I'll give you some beautiful examples through art history. But if you're having a hard time thinking about reflected light, Really just try to think of light as being a fire hose of water hitting something. And to take it a little bit further, there is no such thing as shadow. If you're thinking in this way, shadow is simply non-light. So let's jump back to our fire hose example. Light as a fire hose of water. The water hits here, but it can't hit there. So this is where the water lands. And this is the, where the water can't land. This is where the light lands. And this is where the light can't land. So in a way, it's useful to think of cast shadows as being, not cast shadows, being something in and of themselves, but actually defined by what they're not. They're just non-light. The light is, the shadow simply exists because it's not that. So again, that sounds very um, lofty and almost cheesy, perhaps. But for artistic purposes, I can assure you that that's a really, really great concept that will help you um, a lot in the future. Now, there's this little half tone that is one of the most important things in drawing and painting. When light hits a, an object, the highlight never sits directly against the, uh, at the external contour against the background. I'm saying never, and please bear with me that there are exceptions to all these things, but what you'll find very often is that the highlight exists within the external contour, but does not make it all the way to the external contour. So that little half tone right there, if you don't put that in, it flattens your drawing. It actually makes your drawing look um, like somebody splat it down. So now I will take my finger again, this is an accelerated drawing, and I'm going to shade, I'm going to just blend and create a gradient everywhere but at that highlight, like so. If you want a cheating trick, um, one of the things that I do is I will take a sanding block and I will rub my finger on a sanding block and use that almost as a big, as a big pencil to fill in big areas like that. That's a little trick I have. Um, okay, so here we have background, external contour, midtone, highlight. Then we have midtone, the shadow shape, which ultimately is absorbed into everything else. We can call this shadow, reflected light external contour, cast shadow. So I'm going to put a few lines out and just label the rest of these transitions. 
already have reflect light, we already have cast shadow. So background. Get a darker pencil. Half tone. Half tone. Shadow shape. Shadow. Reflected light and cast shadow. Let's move reflected light up to here just for clarity's sake. Cast shadow. Now, as we're working, um, there there are a few properties to these um, to to light that we can discuss that will really be really helpful to you as time goes by. So one is that the principal light, the highlight right here, um, is always the brightest bright. You'll never have in the shadow area a bright that comes as close to this bright right here. That always has to be jealously guarded. That is your brightest bright. So now your reflected light right over here always should be a little bit darker than that principal light. And if you do that, then that principal light will always feel, um, the, the light that's flowing over the form will always feel convincing. I'm just gonna go like that. Okay, um, if, you, if you go ahead and you put in a really bright bright over here, I'm just gonna erase that in, it, it wrecks everything. The whole thing really gets flattened. So you wanna be really careful to keep your brightest brights. I'm not saying there'll never will be information over here, but you always want your brightest bright to be your brightest bright. And you want to carefully guard that so that the three-dimensional volume is conveyed uh, really well. So I'm gonna strengthen that shadow just a little bit. Okay, so there's another rule and it's called violating a highlight. So violating a highlight is when there's information found, and you'll see something in front of you that has a real dark dark in the highlight area, and so you're tempted to go like this, and you put it in. That is called violating a highlight, and it's one of the absolute uh, taboos of the drawing world. You never, ever, ever violate a highlight by putting in a deep, rich dark in an area that's reserved for highlight. And you could say, well, what if I do see that really rich, deep, dark? Um, oftentimes what artists elect to do is they elect to leave that really, uh, that dark information, they'll elect to leave it out, or they'll hint at it very gently, they'll hint at it without really putting it in. So it's still, that highlight still stands out. The other thing that we can talk about is the cast shadow. So with the cast shadow coming off of this form, as light hits here, the cast shadow is, is sharpest at closest to the form. But as we go this way, there's more ability for the light to mix into the shadow all throughout here. And so as we go along, The light mixes into the shadow and the shadow becomes softer. There's not much room for, for vibration through here, but the further away we go from the source, the softer the shadow becomes. So that cast shadow, I'll get my precise eraser out, can get really precise if you wanted to at the source. It could be really sharp, but then as it goes away, it gets much, much softer. Again, these, these are general rules, but there are exceptions to all of these things. So don't feel that in every light condition, indoors, outdoors, that this has to be uh, followed, but just understand that that's a general idea in nature. Okay, so there we have, again, let's run through the uh, stages. We have the background, we have the external contour. I should probably switch those around. Half tone, half tone right here, highlight, 
half tone, shadow shape, deep shadow, reflected shadow, reflected light, sorry, and cast shadow. Sometimes I'll even put a little burst of light right here just to heighten that sense of light of going around the form. Leonardo da Vinci has a series of really interesting drawings where he has an object that's in the water. It's in water and then a stream is hitting it and then going around the object. Uh, you could ask yourself, well, why does that matter? It's a study in water and turbulence, but Leonardo da Vinci was also exploring the parallels between the world of light, in my opinion, he's exploring this, and the world of water. Again, both travel in waves. Think of this in another way of thinking. Think of this as being a, a tree in a stream. Water is hitting that tree and it's going around it. This is blocking the flow of that. And so the further away you get from that tree, the little circular eddies will make their way into the blockage right here. And for me, I have found that to be a very, very useful way. It's really helped me with my uh, portrait drawings and paintings, uh, my still life drawings and paintings. It's really helped me with my um, figure work, landscape. There's not a genre that this doesn't touch, that this doesn't apply to. So if you want, you could spend the next 20 minutes or so just really digging in and making this into a nice drawing of a sphere. Next, we'll hop over to these other items.